morning, right? We are going to record and then post it later on. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so let's see, uh, we haven't heard any um, info about the 2023 guidance, um, but they will have a bunch of updated information as far as clarifying uh, several aspects of the notice of funding opportunity. Um, now, before we move on to the application and sort of details, uh, frequently asked questions from the 2022 round, keep in mind uh, this program is new and there are still kinks to be worked out. So uh, I had hoped before we had this um, 2020, I had hoped before we had this meeting here today that we'd have all the 2023 um, application information. Um, but this is just gonna go off what we have for now. Uh, we'll use the 2022 information as guidance until we get updated direction from the Forest Service on the next round. Um, as it gets later into the year, I just wanted to at least share what we've learned so far in case folks are um, starting to work on the applications ahead of the official application period, um, especially as we approach fire season, we know the workloads will have to <clears throat> shift for many. So we'll just jump right in here. Um, the CWDG uh, is one billion in funding uh, nationwide. It is a five-year program, so we do have four years of the program left. Uh, they will prioritize communities that have a high or very high wildfire hazard potential, are low income, or have been impacted by a severe disaster. So this program will also help communities in the wildland urban interface meet the three goals of the National Cohesive Wildland Fire Management Strategy. And those goals are to maintain resilient landscapes, create fire adapted communities, and improve wildfire response. So this program aims at those first two um, aspects of the National Cohesive Strategy. Um, this five years of funding, they aim to split into 160 million per year of that of the program. This first year, they did award a little bit over that, um, and you you might think, why isn't it 200 million per year? Um, they have uh, dollar amounts that they have allocated for administrating um, the the program. So different states are assisting, like like Oregon is. And some states are helping in even additional capacity than we're doing here in Oregon. So uh, for eligibility, uh, local governments, Indian tribes, state forestry agencies, HOAs, Alaska Native corporations, and other nonprofit organizations that are at risk of wildfire are eligible to apply. You see, there are two different aspects of the funding here. Uh, the first aspect is um, development or revision of the CWPP, also known as the Community Wildfire Protection Plan. Um, so it's only applicable if your um, CWPP is older than five years. The max grant award is 250000 There is a cost share match of 10%. Um, underserved communities can apply for a match waiver. And then timeline for completion is that five-year period from the award. The second aspect of the grant is for project implementation. And those activities must be identified within a community wildfire protection plan that's not more than 10 years old. So the max grant award for that type of application is 10 million and the cost share match is 25%. Also is eligible for match waivers if you have the underserved community um, verification, if you can confirm that. And then also use 
within five years for completion. So a few timelines. Um, in the 2022 round, we had those applications due on October 7th. Application award notices were supposed to come to us by December 31st, but as most of you probably know, that didn't happen until March 20th. Um, funding available to the 2022 awardees, uh, it's to be determined. They have begun work on those agreements now. And so just working with the Ford service directly to finalize those agreements. Um, for the 2023 uh, application period, the second round here, uh, currently the Forest Service is saying a tentative date of May this year. Uh, no specific dates have been given to us. And then they do remain, um, they do continue to let us know that they still plan on having it open for a 90 day period, which last year, um, as mo many of you might know, it was a shorter period, only open for 60 days. So they'll give us a little bit longer to work on them this year. That's the goal. And for the 2022 round, um, I just wanted to show a few numbers of, of how many folks applied, how many were awarded. So, um, we had 29 applications in Oregon, uh, total requesting 66.8 million. Um, some of the other states and how they compare as far as just numbers go. Washington had 46 applications come through. California, 74, probably not a surprise there to a lot of us. Uh, Colorado, 35, New Mexico, 22, and then Montana, 14. And then on the awarded, so we had 10 Oregon-wide, 10 applications that were awarded for a total dollar amount of 23.5 million. Um, and then you can kind of see how a few of those other states compared. So Washington had 14, uh, Colorado only one, New Mexico five, and then Montana four. I'm just seeing how those numbers played out. The Forest Service received 417 Community Wildfire Defense Grant applications, uh, total requests of 525 million. So a lot of interest you can see in this program. Uh, review panels made up of representatives from tribes and state forestry agencies across the nation scored these proposals. And of that, 100 proposed proposals were selected. So they did end up awarding the 197 million, um, which means maybe toward the end of the program, they might have a little less uh, than that, than the 160 million per year that their, their uh, initial plan was for. So this map just shows these 10 um, award applications across Oregon, the little blue dots are the, the awarded proposals. Just thought it was a nice kind of graphic there. Back to this slide, just um, reiterating for eligibility, you have to show that you are an at-risk area, that your area is at risk of wildfire. And so a little bit of the criteria here that, that they give us in the notice of funding opportunity. Um, so an at-risk community is defined as an area that is compromised, comprised of, um, they give us two options. So an interface community is defined in this notice here. This notice is from 2001. It has uh, some communities listed. It's not a very extensive list. So we're glad that they give us this option too. And in this uh, second option, uh, they consider a group of homes and other structures with basic infrastructure and services at risk from wildfire as recognized by a state, regional, or national wildfire risk assessment in which those herbaceous or woody fuel conditions in and adjacent to the community are conducive to wildfire disturbance to a wildfire disturbance event 
which threatens human life or values at risk. So they open it up a little bit and allow us to use some different information to verify that yes, we are an at-risk community. This slide just shows a few of those resources um, that we can use to demonstrate, yes, we are an at-risk community. Um, and I'll go through just a few here. Um, so if you were able to look at some of the, the documents provided from the 2022 round, um, you might be familiar with this first option, the CWDG eligibility spreadsheet. Um, it is here at the wildfirerisk.org. This QR code um, would take you there if you haven't seen it or you don't have that document already. So if you want to scan that, it'll it'll take you. Um, you can download it to your computer and look through it if you'd like to and just see. It also gives um, application example text. So even if you don't even if your community is not there and you can't use that as your verification source. Um, it does provide some good example text to put in your application in those boxes where it asks you that question. Um, applicants that are not identified as at risk in this uh, spreadsheet can use the lo local wildfire risk data if available to demonstrate risk. And so a couple of those other options are listed here. I just wanted to show you um, just the first page there of the, the spreadsheet. This is the at-risk eligibility spreadsheet. We assume that they are going to have something similar to this for the 2023 round. Um, maybe something a, a bit more expanded. So just wanting to show you there that it does help with text, example text. Um, that you are able to use and provides a few more resources as well. In addition, uh, they also provided this, this scoring priority data spreadsheet. So they provide information and uh, communities and you see the tabs there at the bottom to help you um, demonstrate that you are low income that your area maybe has been impacted by a severe disaster and that disaster also contributes to wildfire risk and then um, areas identified as having high or very high wildfire hazard potential so also it helps with example text for the application so really good resources here and then diving into the application specifically. Um, we'll just kind of go through a few frequently asked questions, some places that maybe weren't as clear as um, we had hoped. So um, the first thing that I'll, I'll talk about here is the, the keyword. And this graphic shows just the first page of the application. And you see up at the top, there's that keyword box well, if we didn't put anything in there, it wouldn't let us submit the application. So that was a bit of a source of confusion for a lot of us. And um, just to note, this keyword should be a shortened version of your project title. So we want it to still be specific to your project rather than just putting in there uh, CWPP or defensible space or something like that. And so a couple of um, keyword naming standards or suggestions. Um, include your area, your area name in that, in that keyword and your title as well. On the back end, your title and your keyword are essentially the names of your applications as I, as I can see them in my view and then scorers can see them as well. So something to kind of keep in mind. And then a couple of points about match here. Um, match wasn't defined very well in the initial notice and funding opportunity. 
specifically um, the 10% if you are applying for CWPP funding or 25% for a project, um, that 10% or 25% is of the total project cost. So not on the amount that we are asking for, um, but total project cost. So that was a little bit of a, a spot of confusion on the last round. And, and a good way to think about it is that the Forest Service covers 75% of that total project cost. I did put this graphic in some of the um, documentation and we will post this um, PowerPoint also on our website. So you wanna get those, get these couple of slides in their graphics and it might be helpful, you can go there. And from the application, this is just a snip of the budget section of the application. I just want to show you, it's that right. Um, your match goes off that total project cost on the right there. And then a couple of calculations as far as um, a way to think about it. You know, you divide by that 75% and you get that match amount, so. Again, we'll post this on our website here for the calculations, just if you wanna look at examples. And additional information in that title too. And there's a link here if anyone is interested in needing more information about that. A couple of thoughts about the match waiver. Um, so the Forest Service may waive the cost sharing requirement for a project that serves an underserved community. Uh, in considering a waiver for the cost share requirement, they want you to include your waiver request um, sufficient in your waiver request sufficient supporting documentation that demonstrates um, that your community meets the threshold of vulnerable with a score of 0.75 or above on the CDC social vulnerability index as compared to the nation, or um, your area or community meets the low income descriptions that they provide. So to determine if your project qualifies for the cost sharing requirement, they want us to use the CDC social vulnerability index <laughs> for 2018. So they do have the social vulnerability index for 2020 as well, um, but they specifically direct us in the notice of funding opportunity to use that 2018 data. It might be different um, on this next round. And so that's something that we'll have to, to look into. Um, hopefully they all make it very clear on what info they want us to use. That was a little bit, tricky this last time. So this is what their site looks like. And I just noted that you'll have to go to your to your specific year just because they have other years available. And then a couple of links. Um, the scoring priority spreadsheet also provides information for low income. And then the link for the CDC website is on this slide here. A couple of points about indirect costs um, when you're calculating your budget. We had quite a few questions just come up about these and, and how to try to specify them indirect from direct. So I thought this graphic might be a little helpful to us. Indirect costs uh, represent the expenses of doing business that are not readily identified with a particular grant contract project function or activity, but are necessary uh, for the general operation of the organization and the conduct of activities it performs. So indirect costs you can see here are more like administration, um, indirect labor, utilities, versus the direct costs that are direct labor related to the grant um, supplies, and travel expenses. So a couple of key points, um, refer to your NICRA for contractual guidelines. Uh, 
zero indirect on equipment purchases. So per the Title II. And if you don't have a NICRA established already, then you default to that 10% de minimis rate. Uh, more information can be found here in that Title II link on the bottom of the slide. And then addressing a little bit about um, project implementation. So requirements from the notice of funding opportunity. If you're a community um, that wants to request funding for a mitigation project, um, you have to meet that definition of an at-risk community, as we talked about earlier, and is pretty clearly defined there in the notice of funding opportunity. Um, you have to be following a CWPP. They also give us a little leeway. Um, if you don't have a CWPP, it can be referring to a tribal hazard mitigation plan or a FEMA approved hazard mitigation plan that has a wildfire component and also stipulate that it can't be more than 10 years old. Um, so also have a CWPP or the FEMA approved hazard mitigation plan in place by the application deadline. And then um, the project requested for funding needs to be described in the plan. Whatever plan you're choosing to reference, it has to be described in there. And a little bit more about linking your project to your uh, community wildfire protection plan or similar plan. Um, be specific and descriptive, showing the tie to your CWPP. Uh, also provide the link. Um, the application will allow you to paste a link directly in um, and then give that score or whoever is going through your application um, a little bit of help to find that information that you're referring to fairly easily. So provide them with a page number, um, describe what table, you know, if you're referring to a table or other information to tell them about your project. Uh, county CWPPs and additional information can be found on our ODF website here. So um, this QR code will take you directly to that page if you want additional information about, um, you know, we've got some overviews some details and documents on help creating your CWPP and some other resources. And then below where it says on this, um, on this graphic below here where it says community wildfire protection plans, um, they are listed by county. So if you need a link to your most up-to-date plan, um, they can hopefully be found here. Of note, if your most updated plan is not here, um, would you let us know? Um, you can reach out to me or Christy Shaw. You see her contact information here. Um, she's the National Fire Plan Coordinator. And um, just send her an email and give her, let her know where or get her that most up-to-date version so we can put it on there. And at this point, I should see if I see you're on, Christy. Do you have anything to add to this? No, I think that you've covered it well. And, and I do know that there's a, several counties that are kind of in progress right now for um, updating CWPPs. And so I would encourage you to engage with your county and make sure that um, if you have some specific projects that you do try to get them specifically listed in your CWBP, because I do think that that will um, add some leverage for those projects. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, the more we can tie our project to our plan, to what we've planned, uh, the better it, it looks like for scoring, right? So... Okay, and I just uh, copied and pasted from the Notice of Funding Opportunity some of these examples. Um, so we've got a few tables here that are, that are in there and I'll just go through um, a few and kind of 
kind of highlight some. So this table is examples of uh, planning projects. And you see this, this first one here is the creation of the CWPP or development of a wildfire section in the hazard mitigation plan. An update of the CWPP is eligible. Uh, contract support to assist the community with developing building codes, zoning ordinances, or land use planning. Uh, tabletop or functional exercises to test effectiveness of community wildfire planning. Uh, plan and address public health and safety effects of smoke and mitigation from wildfire and projects that use prescribed fire, so smoke ready efforts. Um, direct staff support for community wildfire mitigation, uh, leadership coordination, um, training in the use of uh, proven effective mitigation practices. Some things that are not eligible, um, GIS and database systems, unless they support a CWPP, wildfire risk reduction planning or fuels mitigation initiative or project, um, small business startup funding not eligible, um, research and development projects also not eligible. I imagine um, with the 2023 uh, notice of funding opportunity, we might get several more examples in all, all categories here. So it'll be some good information to check out once that does happen. Quick pause, Shauna. We have mm -hmm. a question in the chat um, okay. from going back to slide 19. Uh, does the does the specific project uh like the applicant's project name need to be listed in the CWPP or does a list of activities as described in a CWPP meet the requirement uh you will want your CWPP to be as specific as possible um to the the project at hand so if it is a little bit more general or broad um, in the application, you'll just try to make your best case as far as um, applying it to something or priorities maybe that you have in the CWPP. Um, but this is all, um, a lot of these grants that are, that are coming in, they are gonna want us to be more specific, it sounds like with our CWPP. So as you continue to update those, that's something to really keep in mind. Shauna, uh -huh. if, if someone, if you're looking at not updating a CWPP and you're concerned that your specific projects aren't listed or that maybe there isn't enough specificity in a county, you can rather, you, you don't have to update the entire CWPP. You can actually go in and um, create addendums in there. They just have to fully be signed by all the original signers or all the original signing groups. Um, so if you're concerned, so, some CWPPs are very general and say like reduce wildfire hazards in the county. Um, and that's a pretty broad and not very spe specific goal. So you could go in and get all the approved signers to agree to um, some more um, detailed information that would then tie better to your project potentially. Good information to add, Christy. Thank you. Okay, and um, so back to these eligible and ineligible product projects um, listed here. So um, prevention, education, and outreach. Uh, Firewise or similar programs are eligible. Uh, fire education presentations such as the project learning tree, property inspections or assessments, training to conduct property inspections or assessments, uh, implementation of WUI structure, parcel, community fire hazard mitigation methodology, uh, adoption, implementation, enforcement, training of National Fire Protection Association, International Co Code Council, or similar codes. 
uh, ineligible, they have listed here, uh, printing of paper-based materials without an organized outreach. So ineligible, you can't print materials unless they're related to a project, basically. And we get to um, the examples of hazardous fuels reduction and or restoration projects. Uh, so defensible space around homes, businesses, and other structures. Development, creation, and or maintenance of fuel breaks, fire breaks, including shaded fuel breaks. Fuels reduction beyond defensible space adjacent to at-risk communities. Uh, removal of standing woody vegetation, using in several several um, ways here, cutting and chipping, um, using a mechanical mulcher or masticator type equipment mounted on mobile equipment, reduction of hazardous fuels through application of prescribed burn, vegetation management, a few things that are not eligible. Um, capital improvements, home hardening is not eligible under this grant, um, fire suppression training, unless uh, it's related to requirements for prescribed burn qualifications, uh, no fire suppression equipment, and drones are not eligible under this grant. We have a few more <laughs> project examples that are eligible. Um, prescribed fire training, maintenance of fuel fuels projects, um, design and installation of dry hydrants and cisterns. So not a lot of other grants that will allow for that. Uh, purchase of mechanical equipment. Um, and so it gives us a list of eligible equipment options. Uh, purchase of equipment for brush fuel disposal, uh, such as air curtain burner, trench burner. Also this last one here from the notice of funding opportunity, purchase of the following equipment to be used for prescribed fire. So um, all these things you would have to show are not being used for suppression, but being used for your project of prescribed fire. In the initial application phase last year, we had a lot of questions just about um, proposals, including multiple communities. And this guidance is just directly from the Notice of Funding Opportunity. If there is a separate, if you have separate projects in separate communities, they want you to do separate applications. So um, they need to be submitted for each community for purposes of determining eligibility, prioritization, and ranking. So if you um, reach out to me and you say, you know, we want to do these two separate things in these two separate communities, um, just ask me for two different application links when we get there, and I'll send you two. If you have a single project that spans multiple communities, the project can be applied for and described within the same application in narrative form. So they, they could potentially give us some additional guidance on this um, in the 2023 um, Notice of Funding Opportunity. It was initially um, difficult to prioritize and rank, um, and even some, some instances determine eligibility when they were in separate community, when a project was in separate communities, because sometimes, for instance, uh, one community would qualify for that low income status, and the community they were partnering with would not qualify. So we have yet to see how all of those scoring um, applications were done, all of the, the details and everything. So we'll learn more about that, but just look to see if, if that's something you're thinking about doing, um, look for additional guidance on that coming. And talking about scoring, 
um, just a note here that this scoring rubric is listed in the Notice of Funding Opportunity. It is in there. So it is always going to be a good idea for you to just read through those um, those scoring, that scoring rubric and see, you know, this is for the first box that's scored. Um, you're going to get a high score if you meet all of those um, implementation I, goals, right? In this, if you're going to score seven to 10 points, and that's, of course, what you want. So, and then as we read through, you know, if you if you don't address things, um, for instance, in the medium score here, um, you know, they're only going to get uh, three to six points if they don't, if they mention the cohesive strategy and the state force action plan only cursory. So they want you to put a little bit more um, of an example and, and mention of how your project relates to those. Uh, back to these priorities uh, for this program, they prioritize these communities that have high or very high wildfire hazard potential, are low income, or have and or have been impacted by a severe disaster. And this severe disaster can be wildfire in the last 10 years. It can also be something that has caused an increase to wild fire hazard potential in your area. You know, say um, a windstorm that's downed a bunch of trees, excuse me, trees and that kind of thing. And so you see how the application um, shows us just the scoring that's involved with those three priorities. So um, that low income box is 10 points. And this, this past year, they gave all or nothing points on these, these three areas. So um, uh, severe disaster impact, 10 points, and then wildfire hazard potential, 20 points. So a total of 40 of, of the total 100 points are just in these three boxes alone. You see how that could bump up an application or make, make a significant difference in the score. This is just a note about um, you will, your organization will need to have uh, a unique entity identifier number um, and be read from when you do a SAM.gov registration. Um, so no longer are we using that DUNS number if you're familiar with that, but we will have the unique entity ID. Um, of note, We've had a little bit of feedback just saying that, you know, folks have been asked to pay a fee to register. There is uh, no fee to register in SAM.gov. So go directly to their site. It's just sam.gov. Uh, I think sometimes, you know, folks are getting on these third party sites and, and asked to pay a fee. So it should be fully free. A few tips uh, for successful grant proposals. Read through the request for proposal and develop an appropriate project. Follow directions. Study the scoring sheet closely to understand the grantor's priorities and use each one clearly. Those scores that are going to be looking at your applications are going to have that scoring rubric and they're going to be looking at all of your answers. So that's a good one. Uh, write to your audience. Um, a lot of these of our applications from Oregon will be scored by those maybe in the Midwest or even the East Coast or in the South. Uh, folks in Oregon are not able to score our own applications. So Writing to your audience would be you know, fully describing um, the conditions, you know, the climate, the, the landscape here, as they very well might not be familiar with what Oregon looks like. So something to keep in mind. 
Uh, be direct, be consistent throughout your document, have a good clean budget, one that is project ready upon award, have others proofread, and lastly, don't get discouraged. There's a randomness and unpredictability definitely to the process. And then a couple more thoughts just about planning for the 2023 application round. Um, I, I mentioned that scoring details for the 2022 applications are not yet available. Uh, the Forest Service does plan to have them available to us soon. We're not sure where they are going to post them. So sort of stay tuned for that. Uh, we will have an we will provide a link on our site, ODF site, once the scoring is available. Uh, also, we'll have another virtual round, uh, virtual information session. Once the 2023 guidelines are announced, we'll just kind of go over some changes, some updates that are uh, impactful. Uh, and updated, those updated resources will be posted on our ODF website as well once they're available. So, so keep a look out for those. And then to apply. So these uh, applications are just a little bit different than some of the other grant applications. To apply, most likely uh, the process will be similar to last year's application process. Uh, again, the Forest Service advised there'll be little change to the actual application for 2023, although the guidance will be updated for hopefully additional clarity. And so to apply, um, send me an email requesting an application link. So then what I do is I create the application link through forestrygrants.org. I name, I will name that link um, with your area, organization, and the name of the person that initially requested it. That's how I'm going to track it kind of on the back end. It will be specific to your organization. Uh, when your organization updates the name of your application, if you change your name, which most likely everyone is going to change the name, just let me know if you could remember that piece of it. Um, it helps me track it in their database. When the application name changes suddenly, sometimes I can't find um, I can't find it when it's time for the next step. So um, then once you know that that 90 days or close to 90 days opening is complete and you're done with your application, you just let me know and then I can uh, move forward to the next to find to do the final submitting on it. Uh, most likely we will ask for an early submission of your applications. Uh, likely it will be one week early uh, to the final national final deadline. Um, so my role is not to make any decisions about your application, but just to help where there are questions and provide the technical assistance. So getting the applications in about a week early. It'll help us avoid a few, um, you know, any last minute technical difficulties that might come up. Um, also, I will review applications to ensure all fields are completed. Um, if there is an area that is incomplete, I'll reach out to the contact listed on the application. So that's the plan there. Um, there are also two additional steps on my end. So once you tell me your application is ready for submittal, there are, are two steps on the back end that I have to do to fully submit it. And then um, just a note that final applications are reviewed by the other state coordinators uh, when it comes time to choose who is awarded for funding. So I do not make any decisions about applications, um, about scoring them, or anything for Oregon. And then just a couple of QR codes just for quick access to our um, 
ODF fire prevention page there on the left. And then the community wildfire defense grant program uh, through the Forest Service there on the right, just for easy access. A couple of notes about um, if your application is funded, if it's awarded, um, things to consider just about uh, progress reports. So progress and financial reports will be due quarterly for this program. These are some things we're, we're learning, kind of working through the initial phases for the 2022 20, applicants. Um, these are your quarterly deadlines listed here, March 31st, June 30, September 30, and December 31st. And then all reports are due to the Forest Service within 30 days of the quarter end. So the majority of grants um, give you a 90 day window to have those reports in. So just kind of something uh, administratively to keep in mind. I like this, this picture, this is not work uh, from work done through CWDG just because it's brand new, but uh, work done, similar mitigation work done through the Western States grant program. So. And then um, once again, my contact information, please email me if you have questions. Uh, if you, know, you are even wanting some guidance to start your application process early, if you don't have those uh, documents, those guidance documents from 2022, I can help get those to you and guide you in that direction as well. So, and then, and lastly, if anyone has additional questions. All right, thank you, Shauna. Um, so yeah, we're going to move into our Q&A now and uh, if you would like to unmute yourself to ask your question via audio, please raise your hand and we'll call on you to ask your question. And then if you would like to ask your question without audio, you can just type it into the chat as well. We'll give you guys some time and and yeah, feel free to, you know, if you want to process through this a little bit and have questions coming up later on, feel free to call me, email. Shauna, do you want to put your email, that last slide back up there again so they can't have a little bit more time to get your information? Definitely. Thank you. So you guys don't have to listen to the chainsaw. One more call for any questions at all. Otherwise, we will end early. Uh, oh, like Sean. Oh, go ahead, Sean. <laughs> it looks like I see one question there from Simone there at OSFM. Uh, oh, we, yeah, we, and, and her question was, does ODF have any examples of funded application we can look at? Not yet. So um, the full applications have yet to be released, but that is something the Forest Service has promised us. Um, all applications, um, should be released for uh, the public to view. And then in addition, um, scores, uh, you know, from the scores should be available as well as their comments as they were reading through the application. So hopefully uh, when that does happen, that will provide us a lot of good information for this next round. Oh. 
Any other questions, feel free to raise your hand if you wanna talk or type them into the chat. Two more minutes or a minute. Oh, we have a raised hand. Go ahead, Jen. Good morning, um, Shauna. I think I asked you this at one of the meetings I met you at, but um, as far as getting a link for the application, is it allowable to have three or four different links because you're working with you know, a number of counties or partners? Is that something that's allowable? Yes, definitely. I would rather you have more than you need than not as many as you need. And so, you know, say you had four different applications and you only use two, um, you know, no worries at all. We just would move the ones that you say are finished and you want to submit, we would move those forward. The other ones would just stay there in the portal and they wouldn't go anywhere. So no problem. Okay. Thanks, Sounds Jen. great. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, feel free to raise your hand if you want to uh, say it audibly or uh, type it into the chat. Oh, there we go. Uh, there is one question of will this second round continue to prioritize in the same format, i.e. capture applications that met the three priorities but didn't get selected? Um, the information we're getting from the Forest Service is yes, they will have the same priorities just because that part is part of the legislation for this uh, funding. Um, and so if, you know, so the one caveat is they may uh, relax mm -hmm. their criteria for verification. Uh, for instance, the low income aspect, uh, they were very narrow in, in the guidance you had to use that exact guidance that they gave us. And that guidance was at the county level as far as the low income piece goes. And as most of us are aware, oftentimes that county level data doesn't speak to the community level. So in our uh, discussions after that application period, many states had that same concern. So hopefully, uh, they will let us have a little more leeway with the verification on the low income. You know, maybe we can use a city source or, um, you know, community sources or even, you know, school information just to show, yes, this area is low income, even though the county doesn't show at low, low income. Okay. All right. And then we had another question for where will the recording of today's discussion be available? We're going to put it probably on our YouTube channel and Sean, I would assume also our website, the web page for the CWDG as well. Yeah, that'd be great. We'll put a link there as well. All right. And it looks like we have time for one more question if somebody has one. All right, and with that, I think we're good to close out uh, this webinar. Thank you to everyone for attending. Yeah, thanks for joining us. And thank you, Shauna, for presenting. It makes it way better. <laughs> Have a great day, everybody.